lecture, Promoting Gender Equity in Elementary Science Education. This comes to this evening as um, Professor Maria Rivera-Bellucci and Professor Mormons, Felicia Mormons, like come to us after participating in the Barnard Global Symposium in Sao Paulo, Brazil this year. And this is our fourth lecture in our new NOICE series. Um, this is sponsored by NSF. It's part of the, uh, it's attached to a course actually, but it's, it's a STEM colloquium that is ongoing, and this is our first semester having it. This is the fourth and final lecture of this semester, but we will continue into next year and have it both fall and spring. So we hope you continue to come. And just a little bit about our speakers, and just a little bit. So Professor Mormansa comes to us from Teachers College. She's in the science ed program there where she does elementary, middle school, and secondary science methods courses. She's been at CC for nine years. And Professor Rivera comes from the Barnard Ed program. She's newly tenured, has been part of the program for eight years. And we're excited to hear what they have to say. So I turn it over to you two. Thank you. So, good evening ladies and gentlemen in the back. <laughs> so we're glad that you're here today with us and we want to share with you probably a part of our ongoing work as we try to develop and we're able to try to make some connections with um, contacts in Brazil as we continue with this. So of course you can see the slide, it gives our, our title of it, so Promoting Gender Equity in Elementary Science Education. So the, uh, we want to also introduce our colleagues that I just mentioned to you that are also going to be collaborating with us on this particular project. So Melina Furman, Maria Bodesta, um, Maura Stella Sarmento, and Luciana Huber. And so again, when, when we went to Brazil, we, were, we wanted to actually meet with our colleagues over there, and that was our intentions, but we were not able to meet with them. But instead, we had a really great time attending the Women's Symposium and then getting out into the and to the land. <laughs> you know, we got out and was able to uh, walk around and even get lost. So we had a very interesting time in Brazil, but it was really good. It was my first time there, and Maria's too. So why elementary science education? At the heart, both of us are really true elementary people, and so we really try to emphasize within our teaching and our research the emphasis on elementary science education. So although science education is universally recognized as essential for producing scientific literary citizens and developing and maintaining a competitive edge in the global economy, elementary science is not the case. And oftentimes, in the elementary school program, very little science is actually taking place, and we actually want to change that. So I'm not really sure if that's been your experiences as well, if you spend any time in elementary schools making observations or trying to teach, but we don't have a whole lot of science going on and we're trying to change that. So some of the challenges that we do face in elementary science education is that elementary teachers often lack adequate content knowledge. So in terms of my teaching and also with Maria and her methods classes, we get students who, uh, who, are not who are not science majors, and so part of that is they're not having the uh, content knowledge and also therefore not having the confidence to be able to teach it. There was a low status compared to literacy and mathematics, so ELA is being tested, mathematics is being tested. Though science is being tested, it's not one of your high subject areas of priority. There's little recognition of the efforts to teach science, so, student, so teachers are not given incentives to teach science, and if schools have science specialists within the school, they kind of defer, default all the science teaching to that one person, or maybe even you're very lucky if you have two people within the uh, elementary program. And so teachers who are regular classroom teachers don't take that as, as part of their responsibility. There's limited materials within the classroom to teach. Teachers have very little professional development to build their content knowledge, to build their confidence to be able to teach science. And then there's that limited time, again, related to mathematics and literacy. Science often is that subject gets pushed out. Uh, if, there is, if there is an assembly or if there's something that's going on within the school, then science is usually the subject that they kind of take that time away. Many science education reforms infuse materials only, and so science, again, is not, students are not learning science in, uh, at the level of being able to understand it through the content or their skills or their knowledge, and again, that's one of the defects of not having enough science materials to be able to learn the science. 
teachers still need support with their content and pedagogy. And a lot of that is what's happening with Maria and I teaching in our methods classes, really helping our teachers to develop the content knowledge, develop their confidence, and to be able to um, teach science at the elementary level. There is a set curriculum that can limit creativity and ownership. So in New York City in particular, they use the FOSS kits. And so oftentimes if teachers are using the FOSS curriculum, they kind of go through it um, script by script or, or follow directions with little variation off of that. And, and teachers are able to miss those really valuable opportunities if students have questions and want to be engaged in science, but I have to follow the script. So we want to be able to help teachers to look beyond the script with that. So that's also one of the challenges. And then finally, teachers need support adapting the cur curriculum to their particular students' needs, to their students' backgrounds, to their students' interests. So if you take all of this as a collective, there are many challenges to teaching elementary science. And again, one of the challenges that we have, and one of the actually also opportunities that we have, is to try to uh, work with these with the students that we have in our classes. And this is also part of our uh, endeavor for research. So girls' science identities. Do, would you all say that you have a science identity? Some of you, some of you are hesitating to shake your head. And so there is research in science education that relates to students and their science identities. But by the age of 10, girls um, may already begin to exclude the possibility of thinking about science as a career option or even a science uh, as a major. And so we really want to capture those early ages to get students involved uh, with science and the interest that's related to it. So recent work in gender and science education has been able to problematize the approaches that girls take related to science. And so we're looking at these ideas with some of our colleagues around, what kind of a girl does science? So is there a set kind of identity related to that? And how can we change our identity so girls can actually see themselves being science, science persons? So girls had different notions of what femininity means and how that's related to science. So girls often think, well, girls can't be scientists. You know, you still have these perceptions that it's a man-dominated field, and they actually have those ideas even as early as, you know, well, I would say early as first grade oftentimes too. There's also, what does it mean to be a good student? We have colleagues that have looked at our, 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 our identities related to students wanting to have that good identity and trying to make that relationship connected back to science. And then the role of family and cultural norms and how to shape girls' uh, attitudes. And so it's very important to also have family connections, having parents to encourage girls to go into science. So how can we leverage best practices across international contexts to enhance gender equity in elementary science? That's, this is really our large uh, research question, and this is part of what we're going to be talking about with you on this evening. Like, how do we do that? So this is just one quote from one of Ashley Maria's uh, pre-service teachers when she says, allowing students to participate with their cultural and on-world on examples really spark the discussion in class as well as students' attention to the lesson. So really paying attention to students, what their backgrounds are, what their interests are, is one way to really try to shape differently what science is gonna look like. So what are those high leverage practices that teachers have to encourage girls to go into science and to encourage them to become a lot more interested in learning science? So our study, and part of it is, is, our, uh, our, is still developing. So we're actually gonna share with you what the developments are in terms of what our interests are, uh, and, and kind of like, like, like take you through in terms of how we're trying to conceptualize and think about our research around gender and girls. So we're looking at a comparative analysis, looking at three different uh, gradients, as Maria calls them, looking at this urban, suburban, and um, rural gradient of, the, of three different countries, the United States, Brazil and Argentina. And I'm gonna give you a little bit of background uh, on um, actually North Carolina as the United States context, and then Roberta's gonna give you some more context related to Argentina and Brazil. But I grew up in a rural district in North Carolina, so there it is there, the state of North Carolina. The, 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 um, the county is not very far from our capital, which is in Raleigh, but I wanted to just give you an overview of what that county, what the statistics look like in that particular county. So we have 44 schools in our county. Um, and you see most of them are at elementary schools. There's a total enrollment of more than 33,000 students within the school district. Um, and then there's also the student profiles that you have related to um, ethnic and racial um, distinctions. Um, and then there are more than 4,000 employees within the school, with more than 2,200 of those being classroom teachers. But the other thing that we're related to this particular district is the second fastest growing district in North Carolina. So which means we're having a lot of influx over the years with students coming in and predominantly students of um, um, diverse backgrounds, so um, ethnic and racial diversity, to the point that um, the statistic here says that there are 48 birth countries of students that are in the county, 
Uh, 42 different languages being spoken in the county. So again, that brings a really great challenge for teachers in the county. And there are more than 2,800 ELL students. And so I present this information to you because again, it's one of the things for me to think about the larger context of what teachers have to do at that early elementary level to engage students in science, but also being aware of these contextual issues that they, that are, that they are also facing. So we, the setting that we have is going to be three elementary schools in the county and also two middle schools. And I'm just giving you a little bit of information related to all of those to um, just kind of think about and also for Marie and I to kind of put a, a bigger context to the work that we're going to be doing. So if you look, I'm giving you the information for science. And as I studied this information on the counties, you can see that their science scores have kind of been going up and down. And again, part of that influx of, the, uh, of different students coming into the county, uh, teachers not having professional development as well. A couple of summers ago, I went home and actually worked with the middle school science teacher. Um, the teacher told me he had not had professional development in years. And it was really um, a good experience for me to think about because again, I grew up in this county and I'm very passionate about science and learning, but to go back and see that, that students had not had the same experiences that I had when I, when I was growing up. So here I have the middle schools. And again, you can see, uh, again, the science scores kind of fluctuating up and down. But even in the um, middle school, you do have some slight increase. But when I looked at all this data of the schools that were just close in proximity to a, of the county that I live, I also looked at the schools outside of the county. And so these schools that I've chosen are on Title I schools. And so they have some resources, but they don't have as many resources as, uh, as well-funded schools within the county who are actually doing very well in um, meeting uh, in the score, uh, in the grade test scores, and their science scores have actually have gone up exponentially in comparison to these other schools that are Title I schools. And so it becomes these equity issues that we're also interested in trying to learn about. Can um, you Title I are those schools who are, uh, have predominantly um, students of low uh, SES. Uh, are there are also schools that are uh, categorized as having um, um, high numbers of students of racial and ethnic backgrounds. Uh, what's the other third category? What's the this three categories for Title I? Do you remember? Language, okay, language. And so all of those factors being addressed within that. So these are five of the schools in comparison um, to that, and I have been labeled Title I schools. So now the, uh, Maria is going to come and give you a context of the other schools that we meet for that, uh, that are part of our study to kind of give, again, give you that large contextual uh, understanding of where our work is coming from. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, education in Brazil. And the first thing that you should notice is that um, there's a two-tiered system there. Now, it's not unlike here. Um, you know, we have our private school systems here. And many of you who maybe either attended or have seen private schools know that what's inside the private school is often, you know, very glaringly um, different from what might be seen um, in, in public school classrooms and certainly in, in classrooms in high poverty districts. And so what are some of the differences that you see uh, between these two classrooms. Rebecca? you're noticing? Remind me of your name. Linda. Linda. Okay. Okay. Any other things? Let's try and get one more. Cassie? Um, the teacher at the public school um, is, a, is not necessarily just in um, it's about yeah, and, and you may notice that in the private school classroom there are actually two adults uh, working with the children, mm -hmm. whereas there's only one in the public school. And so it very much is a two-tiered educational system. Anyone that can afford to pay to send their children to private schools will send them um, to the private schools. And this doesn't mean that the country is not spending money on education. In fact, um, 
by GDP, they're up, they're, they're above 5% of their GDP um, there is, is being spent currently on education and they have a goal, they've set a goal to spend 10%. Uh, and so they're really rapidly trying to infuse a lot of funds into the system. Um, but you know, as you can see, it, it's, um, it's going to take a while because they literally don't have the facilities and the, and the teachers with the right qualifications in place. And so here what I wanted to do is um, talk a little bit about the linkage between uh, poverty and then educational attainment. And so what I want you to see on the left is you know, your, your typical map of Brazil. And you can see where the two major cities are uh, in the south, Sao Paulo. Uh, I'm going to point it out to you over here. Um, huge city, biggest city, and then also Rio de Janeiro are down here. So in the south, over here, if you look on the other map, you can see that that is where the higher income uh, is situated. And then if you start heading north up the coast, you'll see the very pale areas. Though That's where the lower uh, per capita income is, and then also um, up in the northwestern region, um, the, Amazon, the Amazon basin there. And so one of the things that happens is that in rural areas, um, they're, they're, and this is a picture from a school in a rural area. This is in Monte Alegre in the state of Manau. Um, so although you have this robust industrial country, there's a tremendous cleft between rich and poor. And some of the poorest people in Brazil are in those agricultural communities that are in the northeastern part of the country. And what you see here is a schoolroom, and this literal this comes from a project site where they where you can donate money to build schools in Brazil, and you can see the building plans. And on the building plans, they have labeled you know girls' dormitory and boys' dormitory. They're building room, schoolhouses with you know the girls' classroom and the boys' classroom, and that's why you only see girls uh, in this photo because in those rural areas, um, apparently they. Uh, teach the children separately, girls and boys. So that's kind of interesting, right? And when you start thinking about, you know, if we do a survey in a school like that, what are girls going to be thinking about science, being that they're educated separately from boys? So for Argentina, we have a, a similar pattern. Again, um, you can kind of see where the uh, higher income areas are closer to the cities. Um, one of the things that's interesting um, in speaking to our colleagues in Argentina, in team Argentina, what they said was that the suburbs there are not like the suburbs um, where, that we have here in, in, in uh, certainly in the New York area, where the suburbs tend to be wealthier and the public schools tend to be better. In fact, there's kind of like once you get outside the perimeters of the city, um, the, it's not as wealthy and um, the schools are not as, as good. So then here we are in the US. And since you kind of know all these places, uh, those of you that are from here, you can kind of see again where the poverty tends to be concentrated. And I actually want to draw your attention to this little map uh, down here, which happens to be a map of Puerto Rico. Uh, and Felicia and I were recently there. We had our national conference there. And we've you know, formed a relationship. We have a, a connection to a particular school there. And so when I saw this map, I was like, oh my gosh. Because we had already been talking about maybe adding Puerto Rico to this study that we're doing. And what you see here is that uh, most of, the, of Puerto Rico is labeled either 50% um, to 75% of the people in those counties are living in poverty, or 35 to 50%. So you can see that there's a lot of people living in poverty throughout the island. And then when you look at the next slide, um, this is just the first page from a report that lists all the schools that are in need of improvement uh, in Puerto Rico. This is a 38-page report with lines going down each page just like this. And CLB, yes, exactly. And they filed for a waiver because clearly they're not going to meet AYP um, by 20, what is it, 2013? So they did file for a waiver. But it's important for you to see how many schools. It's virtually every school. In other words, it would be the exception um, of a school that's not in some stage of improvement. 
So what basically what happens is you, when you're a failing school, there's the first year of identification, the second year, third year. So you'll see primer año, segundo año, and tercer año. And then what happens is they go into corrective action. After their corrective action, they go into restructuring. And they've listed restructuring uh, years one, two, three, four, and five. Um, so you have schools that are in their fifth year of restructuring. Now, ideally, those schools that are in the fifth year of restructuring have improved. But this just gives you uh, a sense of the nature of the problem, that there's a strong link between poverty and low school attainment and, you know, and quality and outcomes and things of that nature. So here's New York City. Uh, and you know, so the, these maps uh, should also uh, look a little familiar to you. We have Staten Island over here. Here's the borough of Manhattan, the Bronx, um, and then we have Brooklyn and Queens. And again, where you see the dark blue, which is the concentrated uh, poverty, right, um, medium income, there on the map on the right, those are schools that have been open and closed since 2002 uh, to the present. Uh, so as you may know, under the current mayor, there have been a lot of school closures, a lot of schools being closed and then reopened. And where is this happening? It's happening, again, in these high poverty areas. And so this is kind of a measure of school stability uh, and school quality. And so the green dots are schools that have been closed, the white dots are new schools, and the light green dots are new charter schools that have been opened. Any questions so far? So in addition to making the link um, between poverty, um, there are some cultural interest in influences that we think um, are going to be very interesting in this study. Uh, and one is that uh, both Argentina and Brazil have female presidents. Uh, so on the, on the left there you see Dilma Rousseff, she's uh, the president of Brazil. And then on the right you see Cristina Fernandez uh, de Kirchner, uh, she's the president of Argentina. And so they each have you know, very interesting uh, stories. Dilma was um, a former you know, activist. Uh, she was incarcerated in the 70s. Um, and part of the resistance. And under the previous president, she was the energy secretary, then elevated to chief of staff, then ran. And this is her first term as uh, president of the country. In Argentina, Cristina is not the first female president. Uh, they've had a female president before in the 70s, so she's the second. Uh, but she's also the first female to be reelected. This is her second term uh, that she's serving there. And so here you have these two countries with these strong female leaders, which you know, has us wondering, uh, you know, what effect might their leadership be having on girls um, in terms of their beliefs about gender, in terms of their career aspirations? Uh, their attitudes towards science, given that Dilma was a former energy secretary and she has all these you know, STEM initiatives that she's you know, doing and science without borders and things of that nature. Um, so attitudes towards science or science careers and even just their sense of hope for the future that you know, their lives can be better. Uh, and so this picture here I actually took when I was down in Brazil um, in a nightclub because she's really um, like, almost like a folk hero. And you know, one of the people in the club, you know, was pointing this picture out to me and saying, "Oh, you know, that's our president. You know, that's her incarceration photo." And they're really very proud. Uh, and this was a this was a, a young girl, really very proud of her and and um, you know what she's done. And so again, it just has us wondering what might some of these cultural influences be, um, and how might they be different uh, from things you know here in the U.S. So what we want to do is um, explore our methodology a little bit. And so at this point, we'd like you to um, turn on your clickers, if they're not on already. I'm going to turn one on. You're going to have one? Yeah. I'm going to press the green for both. OK. Is everybody ready? So after I hit this little button, then you'll have a chance to log in your Question. I am sure that a woman will be elected president of the United States in the next election. Everybody's recording. 
recorded? These are our results. So let me move this up. There. Strongly agree, none of you. <laughs> uh, agree, two of you. Okay, neutral, four of you. Disagree, four. And then one person says strongly disagree. And so part of our methodology that we're going to be using, and we'll go into some more detail as we go along, is that this polling system allows every individual to record their response. And so this, uh, this gives an opportunity for everybody to have a voice. But the other part that comes out of this is an opportunity to actually discuss. And so for those two people who said that they agree, give us a little bit more why you agree that this is a possibility to happen for us in the U.S. Well, I wasn't agree. Um, and I actually am hoping that, you know, we get a strong female candidate. I mean, it's more my hope than, um, you know, and, and that if we get a strong female candidate that, you know, there's enough support that you know, I, think, I think she could get elected. So, mm -hmm. that was me. Okay. Oh, our camera woman. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think there's a lot of suspicion that Hillary Clinton will run. Yeah. And I think she has a lot of support already. So I think that there's a good chance that she could be elected. Okay. And then we had equal number of people who were at that neutral stage and also ones that said um, disagree. So anybody want to share comments for either one of those? Yes. Um, I think neutral because while I really want there to be a strong female president, I'm not sure if um, some areas of the country are ready to handle that yet. And I really, I would love to see that happen, but I feel like there's a very good chance it might not. So I feel like it's kind of at this point in So we'll move on because we're going to get some more detail about our methodology a little later. So we take the graph away and move to our next question. So we have another question for you to participate. I think science is a field where girls can have successful careers. So let me start the polling. Okay. Ten of you strongly agree, and we have that one person who's at neutral. Would the neutral person care to respond? If you don't care, it's okay. <laughs> but what about you know the ten of us who responded uh, strongly agree? Does anybody want to give some comments on that one? Let me move the question in case you need to see it again. Yes. I think uh, to me it's like the way this question is phrased, it's sort of predicated on the idea that girls can have a successful career at all. So if that's a given, then I think everybody kind of recognizes that scientific technology is the growth, high potential area economy wide. Mm -hmm. So I, I just feel like the way this sentence was phrased, I was sort of forced into it. Okay, and again, we're going to be, oh, I thought you had your hand up, no, okay. And again, we're going to get into the methodology of all of this, why it's done, and the strengths and weaknesses of this. I and think and there's I one, you want to? that um, I have a successful career in science, mm -hmm. so absolutely I agree girls can have a successful <laughs> career. <laughs> <laughs> My family encourages me to learn science. Okay, that's everybody. Oh, really good family support. And so it was mentioned a little earlier in, in my part of the presentation about having that strong family uh, involvement and encouragement for girls to go into science. So it's really good seven of you strongly agree. How does your family support you? Um, well, growing up, we always uh, like loved going to the science museums and going and watching uh, like all the different educational documentaries. Mm -hmm. We always did that. Um, we also had like lots of children's music, and uh, I, I mean, I still listen to children's music sometimes. And it's just like it's so exciting, like in putting music together with like learning about different things mm -hmm. and bringing students in. Um, also, science is always been a fun subject, so I came home 
can see, and naturally there's um, um, emerging research. More and more people are looking at those out of school experiences also and trying to take advantage of those and bringing them to school to make those connections. And it's really important for girls to be able to do that as well. So one last person want to comment if related to this one. How does your family support you in your science? And so I remember I told you I lived in a rural area growing up. And so science for me was not the museums. I had never gone to a museum until, I mean, fairly recently, like my, well, not recent, but in my adult life. Uh, and so actually just running around was the science for me. And I remember um, actually a couple of little boys down the street brought me a dead bird. They said, can you dissect this? And I think I was like nine. I said, yeah, let's dissect it. So to me, you know, the, the involvement of science was really out, you know, in collecting um, Bird, um, not birds, but collecting uh, insects. Insects. I remember doing an insect collection for one of my science projects in elementary school, and um, just picking different kinds of flowers and weeds that were growing around in the yard and all of that. So all of those connections, but it was not made a, a connection when I was in school. My teachers probably had no idea what I was doing, dissecting things, you know, or or picking flowers and trying to figure out like how did they grow and you know what color were they, and what's the name of them. And so there are lots of experiences that we have, and especially girls would have even forms of cooking in the house, and being able to make those connections back to engage in interest in science. So those family connections are very, very important to bring, to, um, to, uh, to make more known for girls, too. So we had one last question, too, right? I think so. OK. OK. I had very positive experiences with science in school. Thank you for the start the poll. OK. positive experiences in school. What was your school science experiences like? Yes. I'm sorry. Um, I'm just not a science person. Science for me was always horrible. And I was always the worst one in the class. Uh -huh. Science was never very enjoyable for me. Mm -hmm. And up front. Um, I think it was a mix of that and also um, just the way the classes were taught. I, I don't think I realized that So going back to those connections to identities. And so as, sci as science teacher educators, this is important information for us to know about the students that are in our classroom. So definitely those who have very negative experience in science, we hope that we can provide experiences where we can turn that around. And so we've been able to do that in our methods classes. So this is good. This is good. And we took my class. Yeah. Change your mind. done is we spent a lot of time, you know, researching the backgrounds of, you know, the different countries and what the educational systems are like. Um, it also takes time to get permission to do research, and so we're in the process of, you know, getting the permission to do the research here and there. Um, but in our study design, you know, early on we knew we wanted to do a survey, um, and we wanted to look at students in grades three through eight, 
using a five-point Likert scale. And these are some sample questions that, you know, these are not actually definitely going to be on the survey, but these are some sample questions, you know, from some of the study that we've done and gathering questions and things like that. Right now I have a document that has about 100 questions in it, so it's got to get scaled down. But so some of the questions are things like, I'm sure that I can learn science. Studying science is just as good for women as for men. Or my friends see me as a science person. And so that's the basic design. And, and so survey research, as you may know, is, is very useful in terms of being relatively uh, inexpensive for large samples. Uh, and, and you can use survey research to kind of describe the characteristics of a large population. And generally, the measurement is more precise. So if you ask a good question, right? So one of the things that came up earlier, you know, Hillary was saying, the question kind of forced me to answer it this way. And that's not a good question, right? So we wouldn't use that question. You'd want to use questions that are really clear and precise and are, are going to give um, predictable answers in different you know, settings. And so um, also, you can ask many questions. And so surveys tend to be strong on reliability. However, there are some weaknesses in that questions are inflexible. Um, they can be hard, it can be very hard to capture context. And so each of you kind of had a context that you were bringing to answering uh, just those sample questions that we answered. And, and just from the little bit of dialogue that we had, you could see how those contexts were different. And so people's real feelings, uh, they often don't really fit into those dichotomies, such as agree or disagree. And sometimes when you ask a particular question, you know, participants may struggle to recall information. How many of you had to think, you know, really hard about, well, gee, you know, were my science experiences um, positive or negative? Or how many of you started thinking, well, gee, some of them were positive, some of them are negative. How do I answer this question? Um, and so what's the truth? Uh, and then what if it's a controversial question, like, you know, um, and, and you don't feel safe uh, giving a true answer? And so, uh, one of the weaknesses, obviously, uh, in, in some is that, you know, they can be weak on validity. And so one of the things that we're planning on doing is we're planning on also incorporating focus groups in each of the countries uh, and in each of the schools that we do the surveys in to provide insights into how the girls think and really try to bring a deeper understanding uh, to, the, to, the, to what we're trying to study. And so... Um, the reason you do a focus group is, you know, one of the reasons is economy. So instead of having to do 20 interviews, you can do two focus groups with the same amount of people and, and get information, input from all those people. And there's the group interaction, and very often that group interaction can be very powerful and elicit a lot of interesting ideas. But not only is there the, the group interaction, there's also a lot of nonverbal communication that happens. So being able to look at, well, who chooses to participate or who chooses not to participate? Are the head nods happening? Are people leaning in or are they leaning out, right? So really looking at some of that nonverbal communication as well. Um, so your group size can be anywhere from 5 to 12 participants. Um, you would do single-gendered groups because you wouldn't want um, there to be any kind of gender dynamics influencing it. And generally, um, what we're looking for are five good questions with some follow-up probes. And so that's you know, kind of our goal, is to develop that. Oops. But focus group has its challenges too, right? Obviously, um, we're looking for five questions, so we have a limited number of questions we can answer, uh, because you, want, you don't want to sit there for more than 45 minutes to you know, maybe an hour with a, with a group of girls. Uh, and then you have to worry about the role of different personality types uh, within the groups. And so you have the experts, and they're going to attempt to dominate the discussion. You also have people that just dominate the talk. You know, they always want to participate. Um, you have shy participants. Um, they're going to have difficulty gaining the floor. And so you have to be able to facilitate that and elicit some responses from them. You also have the ramblers. They have trouble getting to a point. They just go on and on and on and um, take up time. And so. Um, you have the conversational dynamics that happen. Um, and so one of the things that we particularly worry about is who gains the floor first? And what role might power dynamics play in shaping the conversation? And so I have an example that I want to share with you. So this was a study that I had done um, in my Science in the City uh, class uh, last fall, uh, where I was asking the students how they felt before the seminar um, and after the seminar, and I was asking them how confident they felt about their science knowledge. Now, when you look at these responses, um, you actually see that in the beginning of this seminar, 
um, most of the participants kind of strongly agree that they were confident with their science knowledge. And then it kind of went down, right? So if you look at after, 6% um, of them only are strongly agreeing, 50% are now agreeing, 25% are undecided, 19% <coughs> actually disagree. Um, and so you might look at this and you might think that, well, gee, um, I guess I didn't do a good job teaching science content. I'd actually reduce their, their confidence in it. But when you ask them to explain, they say things like, I realize that I have a lot of science knowledge that I don't remember. And these are pre-service teachers, right? It happened a couple of times that students asked me questions and I hadn't a clue. I had no idea. So now we know why they would have less confidence in their science knowledge because they realized that the knowledge that they had before or the assessment of their knowledge before was ina you know, inaccurate. And then this was a response from an in-service teacher. Um, and she talked about you know, really loving professional development opportunities and really enjoying this particular course, Science in the City, because it was inquiry-based. However, um, what she said was, wouldn't it be great if teachers could have more professional development that was grant-based, because you know, she was getting paid to take my class, uh, for content. Like she said, wouldn't it be nice to take a physics course after 15 years of taking education courses? And so, one of the issues is that a lot of PD geared toward teachers tends to focus on pedagogy. And some of them are actually very hungry for content. And this was really important feedback for us to receive at that point because we're in the process of developing science in the city too. And so um, I, I think it's going to be a lot more content heavy and I'm excited about that. I think another thing that came through to me very um, strongly was that it, it allowed us to legitimate the outlier. And what I mean by that is that um, I asked this course, after this seminar, I am more enthusiastic about teaching science. And the first person, um, so you see there's a lot of strongly agree, agree, and there's one undecided, right? And so the first person that spoke after I threw this question out there was this person who in a very strong way was like, I picked A, strongly agree, because in going to the classroom each of these days and teaching the curriculum, just really seeing the excitement that the students have about topics that they really didn't know much about, I think that science is a really a great way for them to learn more about their surroundings and to learn about, to understand the world that they live in and to have control over it, like if they understand it. So she's like, this is a very positive, very strong response. And if that's the first person that speaks, that can kind of, um, you know, and then you get a lot of head nods and a lot of other people agreeing, where's the room for that person who was sort of undecided to kind of come into that conversation and say, well, um, you know, I had a different experience. And what we found, what I found was that being able to show the graph legitimates all the responses that are, that are out there. And so um, she's able to say, well, I was C. And it's not that I lost any enthusiasm, but I think I've also gained a larger understanding of the challenges. You know, the complexity. I'm a biology major and I just have this implicit love of science, but what about all those people who don't love science? How do you reach those types of people? So it's just like kind of realizing the challenges. And so not only did her response nuance things, now I could understand why she felt undecided, um, but, I, but it also, I felt there was room for her to give that response in the conversation that we were having. And so we're really excited about this methodology and we really feel that it's going to help us get at more nuanced understandings than a survey alone would provide us. We're really hoping to see some interesting uh, cross-cultural um, patterns. Um, and we have colleagues that we're talking to in Canada, colleagues in Puerto Rico, so the study's like getting bigger as we go, which I'm very excited about. So just a few acknowledgments, and I'd like to just throw it open for uh, any questions, comments, suggestions at this point. Hi, 
So I know you mentioned that students in the classrooms in Brazil were separated, um, boys and girls, were all of them in, in rural areas. Were the teachers only women or were there male teachers? There were more female teachers than male teachers. Did those male teachers teach males or females? I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> What do you expect to find from your research? What is your hypothesis? So we are qualitative researchers. <laughs> and so by our very natures, um, we don't think in terms of hypotheses before. Um, you know, we don't set up our, our studies that way. Right. But we are hoping to see, um, see a really broad spectrum because we have grades three to eight and we have all these various contexts. But one of the um, things we wanted to look at were what are those high leverage practices that can be um, learned more about so we can share that through professional development, share that within methods classes so that we have a much more like, affordable opportunity for girls or just, you know, even the boys. We even talked about, well, we want to gather the, the boy data too. And so just to really think about um, at, at a bigger scope that how do we just have people enjoy science better, you know, and have more engagement in science and do science teaching better. And so I think that's one of the hypotheses in terms of, you know, we, if we call it that, that we're hoping to be able to learn about um, better practices for science teaching and learning. And I would say that, you know, I, I, I'm really intrigued by this idea that there will be some cultural differences. Um, you know, I, I, and I'd be excited to see, you know, if, if we were able to find some cultural differences and. And, and ways that, you know, because obviously we're New York based, so how can we grow here and learn from, you know, some of the things that maybe are happening overseas? You know, very often we, you know, we think we're ahead, but in a lot of ways we're not. Um, and so really kind of looking at that. Uh, I think this issue of poverty uh, is one that I, um, I care deeply about, and so I'm really hoping, again, to see kind of how can we tackle this issue of poverty uh, and, and, and low educational attainment that tends to be coupled with that we maybe uncouple it. Um, it, would be, it would be awesome if we could come up with some strategies for that as well. So I'm kind of curious. Um, I know nationwide that we're at a point in the US where there are more women going to college, and even within some science fields, there are more women who are earning the degrees than men. And, and yet, I think there's still this issue that, you know, I mean, my personal feeling is until we have 100% female scientists, we're not, we're really shortchanging ourselves because I think we're better at it anyway. But that's just a personal opinion. But uh, <laughs> I feel the same way about presidents. Like, you know, we don't want one once in a while, we want one every time. Um, but I'm just kind of curious as to where, um, you know, kind of sociologically are these other countries and, and also uh, whether you know either specifically or generally off the top of your head what are the differences between New York and North Carolina in terms of those sort of current educational attainments for, for females. So girls are increasing, right? Um, but. In Brazil, what happens is that um, if you look at the numbers, it's white women. Uh, and so you have a lot of, of um, and, 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 when, and uh, so the reason I focused on poverty is because poverty is linked to low educational attainment. But then when you also look at the racial and ethnic patterns that go with it, it's the brown and the black children, both here, and there, um, but not just, you know, because they're, they're also, you know, our poor whites. Um, and so it's this idea that there, there is, you know, the, the numbers of women are increasing in all fields, ex in, like in Brazil, except um, like physics, um, astronomy, like some of those, uh, engineering, uh, the numbers of women are increasing. Part of it is also, um, you know, Melina has, has told us that 
women need to be more educated there in order to compete for similar jobs with men. Um, so that's one of the things. There's a lot more pressure on them to, very similar to, the US. to create, you know, to be more credentialed in order to, you know, have, you know, get jobs and things like that. Did you want to talk a little bit about North Carolina? Um, overall, for North Carolina, there is, it was actually coined an education state some years ago, and so they have had major reforms in North Carolina related to just education in general. But still, the whole area around STEM is still one of those areas that still needs you know, additional support in. Um, and, but I am actually going to go back and check, because it's something when you asked that question, I, I wanted to think about what are the numbers of students that are being enrolled in some of our um, higher um, or more, um, I can't even get it out, colleges and universities. Mm -hmm. uh, I finished at North Carolina, uh, I finished at UNC Chapel Hill. And even in my graduating class, in terms of those who were science majors, very few of them were women, and exceptionally few were women of color. And so I would imagine the same kind of trend is, is still following through. Um, the other thing that I collected from the day, I was looking at my high school. There's only one high school in my county, uh, well, in my recent areas, I should, I should say. And even going back there some years ago, science looks totally different again from what I um, uh, had taken it. But there are very few girls in those AD classes in those honor science classes. And so they're, I mean, again, we're losing them very early on that they don't want to go into higher levels of college. So it becomes a cycle. And eventually we're going to have to figure out how to stop that cycle and that trend because if they're not majoring in science and they're not going into careers in science, and then likely they're not going to be science teachers and they can't go back into the schools to encourage girls to go into science. So it becomes this really crazy wheel. And eventually, you know, we were very interested in trying to figure out ways to kind of stop that. But, um, but overall, it's still very similar, I think, from the, um, the countries that we're looking at in New York City and North Carolina. And there are still places in, in Brazil and Argentina where children are not going to school. They don't have 100% uh, school attendance. Um, and, and particularly in rural areas, what they find is that uh, girls uh, have lower enrollments than boys. Um, you know, the, the families are trying to make an effort to, you know, educate their boys. It tends to even out at the secondary level because boys are dropping out to, you know, work and, you know, gain income for the families. And then when it gets to tertiary, like when it gets to college level, um, it's very interesting because, again, they have a very interesting system there where there are a, a lot of uh, private colleges, you know, for-profit colleges. And the government is pouring a lot of money into, you know, college educations and put quota systems in place, you know, that you have to have so many, you know, black and brown students. Um, and, they get a, and they get a free college education, but what's the quality, you know, becomes the issue. The illiteracy rate is still very high, um, despite, you know, the push. But there, there, there are a lot of things that they are doing that I think are very effective. And so, like I said, we're really trying to get a sense and use these gradients to kind of tease out, well, you know, how is it different from the cities to the suburbs to the rural areas? Shifting back I, actually to the beginning of when you started talking, um, you talked about science identities. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about what you mean by science identities. And what really struck me was the story, Dr. Mensa, about them bringing the bird to you to dissect <laughs> and what that, what, what that meant in terms of your science identity. Because it sounds like you were already not only seeing yourself as the scientist, but seen by others as a scientist? Yeah, it's interesting because I don't think I ever really called myself a scientist growing up. I, I never did. And it was just really like play, and it was fun, and I was curious and wanted to know different things. And so, um, but I was actually m more known in my community as being smart. You know, everybody knew that I was smart. <laughs> so um, so I, that connection in terms of bringing the bird to me to dissect, you know, I never really thought about it, but it, it was probably more so because I was smart. And like, she probably wouldn't know what to do with it. And, um, and these were, um, just the, actually these little young, these little boys like maybe like a grade lower than I was. And so I have a big family, so everybody in our community was going to school with somebody else as well. So these were people in, the, in our neighborhood that I knew fairly well. But I think it was more related to that than, than being a scientist. Can you say a little bit about when, both of you, when your identities as scientists developed? Or when 
Well, I think for me, it was um, just my mom. I mean, my mom was a was um, just a naturalist. And when I say that, what I mean is she was um, a stop and look kind of mom. And no matter where we were, whether we were in the city, it was to stop and look at the street signs. But then when we were in the country and we would spend our summers um, camping, it was let's stop and look at the flowers and let's try to name them. Let's stop and look at the trees. Let's stop and look at the birds. And, and so I think she just really encouraged that in me. But you know what I will tell you is that I'm one of eight and only two of us sort of ended up in science related fields. And so um, even though she was the stop and look mom, I mean, I think there's a lot more that sort of goes into how you eventually, you know, see your path. But I was the one that, you know, always had a garden when, when we bought our house and we had these two little strips of dirt in the backyard. I had my row of corn and I had my row of tomatoes and um, I just was always interested in nature. And so, they, yeah, and then in school, um, it really was my experiences outside of school that I think sort of provided a rich context for that book knowledge, which I was good at getting, gaining book knowledge. Um, and it was taught pretty much the way Weiwei described earlier, just a lot of textbook. Um, we did get to dissect a frog once. That was fun. <laughs> I became the frog expert. <laughs> when I taught, we didn't do the frog. I was actually afraid of the frog. Frank and Bird, but I couldn't do the frog. And so when I taught science, and did, and did dissections with my class. We did everything but the frog. And because uh, my science teacher actually, she had taught my mom um, and my dad. And um, when she had me, we actually had to bring in our own frog for dissection. Mm -hmm. And so at that particular time, I was like, oh, we'll just go to the pond and get one. So I brought in a toad, because I didn't know the difference between a frog and a toad at that, at that particular point. And, uh, and I got marks, you know, I got graded down because I had that, whereas other, students in my class, and so I was actually uh, only uh, um, two, I was the second, um, there were only two African American people in my science class, mm -hmm. in my bio class. So the other students in the class had parents who bought frogs from like biological places. So they had these gigantic frogs, and I had this little teeny toad. And so, you know, even again, those equity issues that come up, and then, and then this, you know, this black girl trying to learn science compared to my, to my, uh, to my uh, classmates, who actually had the gigantic frogs, could see everything, and got additional points, but I got deductions because I had a little teeny toad. So, you know, even things related to that. But, um, yeah, I, I don't think I ever kind of grew up thinking about that I would eventually be like a scientist. Yeah. back to that question of identity and you mentioned something about being smart and I'm just wondering if that the, the perception that in order to do science or be a scientist you have to be smart mm -hmm. and if you don't see yourself or especially young women if they don't think of themselves as being smart then they don't mm -hmm. naturally think of themselves as being scientists I wonder if that correlation exists yeah. You know, there's a lot of work that's being done with science and identities and all these different ways of being able to look at it. And so we have um, colleagues that have looked at this issue around, yeah, you went to the slide. Yeah, I'm going to go to the <laughs> That have looked at these particular issues and, and, uh, and specifically around girls um, having to live up to a certain standard of what smart is to be a science person. And so that does have an influence because they assume the boys are smart and so they will be the scientists. But if you really think about the curriculum that's being taught in schools, it caters a little bit more towards the boys. And so they have an opportunity to gain kind of like smartness within the context of science more so than girls. And so those are another issue to kind of think about what's the content we're teaching to them, how we invite girls to kind of look at the content differently, and you know, how do we change the curriculum. And so uh, one of the issues I mentioned a little earlier around professional development and making adaptations to curriculum. So we have to work with teachers to be able to do that and have examples that are used in the classroom that really will invite girls to come into the classroom and to develop that identity, to say you can have an identity as a science person, you know, and be a girl, and be a smart person, and not so smart. So we even have to start to really challenge the definitions of what smartness is. You know, not everything we do can be, can be considered smart. Uh, and so how are these other ways that we can talk to girls about science and redefine what smartness means when we look at it? So I once had this little girl um, come into my lab. This is when I was um, teaching middle school science. And she came into my lab, and 
I had the microscopes out and we were looking at cells and all the other, and we were actually looking at pond water. And so it was cool. There were all these little things swimming around and the kids are jumping up and down. They're all excited. And I had this one little girl who's completely like shut down, not caring like what's in the microscope, not wanting to participate. And so I had a student teacher at the time and he you know, brings, brings the, the student over to me and, um, and, I'm, and I'm asking her, well, gee, you know, why, why aren't you participating? I was like, this is fun, you know. And she's like, um, well, I'm not good in science. And I said, uh, well, let's talk after class. I want to talk you know, to you a little bit about that. And so then we, she stays after class and she's like, oh, you know, I'm not good in science. And I'm like, well, why do you think that? And she's like, well, I failed science last year. So this is a fifth grader coming into my lab who had failed science as a fourth grader. And I had to ask myself this question, like, how does a fourth grader fail science? I mean, it, it shouldn't be, right? And Andrietta teaches third, fourth grade, and so she's shaking her head, absolutely not, it shouldn't be. And, and, and so, um, and, and, I, and I knew the context, you know, so context matters. Uh, this was a school where the science teacher saw the kids one period a week, and her classroom management wasn't great, and she had a cart, and she had to kind of push into the classroom, and so her grades were based more on behavior. Uh, who was behaving in the class and not talking and who was following the directions than any kind of science content or knowledge they were learning. But this young girl had, you know, sort of internalized this thing as, you know, I'm a failure. And so what I immediately did is I started scrounging in the cabinets and pulling out, you know, baking soda and vinegar. And we ended up doing this little mini experiment. And I was like, you know, what do you think is going to happen? And she made predictions. And I took her through the whole little scientific process, right, that we know of. And it was the cookbook science pro pro process, but the whole point was for her, you know, to get through this little process and have done these, you know, hypotheses and made predictions and made observations and then tried to explain her results and, and, and see her smile, right, when the stuff is fizzing all over the place and so forth. To get her to the point of, you, first of all, you're able to do science. Second of all, you're really good at it. Um, and so don't ever let someone tell you that you can't do science or you can't be good at it. And so then the next time she came in, she was, you know, she was fine after that. And so sometimes, you know, girls and boys, you know, have these negative experiences that kind of really, sh you know, shut them out and exclude them from science. And so it's really being able to question and intervene in that and create spaces for them to see themselves as knowers and doers of science. Thing on? Yes, on. In the studies, were, was science taught as a separate subject? In these studies that are, taught, that are here, uh, I think that yes. um, these were middle school. Yeah, mostly. Yeah. The reason I ask that is that because I think that that's the issue: is being being taught as separate subjects and not being integrated so that you understand that the connections between things, and I think that happens for both boys and girls, but mm -hmm. I can imagine with girls in particular. Because mm -hmm. um, they like to they want Right, to even, I mean, I think it's the way we approach science is something that's separate from other things, so you have to be, you know, you got to be good in science or good in, there's not, you know, math, you don't go out in the world and get a job doing math, you know. <laughs> science is integrated with so many other subjects. So I just wonder. That's a good point. The fact that we do teach, even in elementary school, why it's taught as a separate subject instead of integrated with something, a goal of mine. And a lot of these studies we're, we're doing, um, you know, for example, some of the studies that, that Edna Tan did, um, she was looking at, you know, the, the curriculum was, you know, a lot of community based projects, which by their nature are going to be interdisciplinary. And, and so why is it that girls were able to author identities, science identities, through these community-based projects? Um, you know, that's some of, the, some of the research that she did is, is pointing to that. And so what we want to be able to do is take some of these qualitative studies that are being done and kind of field test them with girls and think about, um, you know, sort of more broad scale, because these are small scale studies done, you know, with a few girls can we kind of get some more broad scale data and look at it across a lot of girls and see if you know, these same ideas uh, resonate with them. Yay. Any other questions?
questions? So good to see you, Andrietta. So thank you all for your comments and your participation and everything. Thank you very much. Anyway, we made your work. Mm -hmm. <laughs>